Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another great webinar put on by the New England Regional Defense Industry Collaboration, NERDIC, uh, hosted by the Connecticut Center for Advanced Technology. Uh, we've got a great program today, again, focused on technology. Um, technology demonstration, augmented reality for Industry 4.0. A lot going on in the Industry 4.0 space. And when you look at AR and VR and MR, there's a lot going on there. We've got a great company today called SphereGen, who's going to be presenting and kind of get, making sense of all of this and, and really what it means to companies. As you can see on the slide here, we're going to be joined by some great partners, Eric Fogelman uh, with the Connecticut um, State Technical Assistance Program, and that is uh, CONSTEP. Uh, we've got the presenters, Amy Pacelli and Andrew Gogliardo, lead uh, reality developer for SphereGen. Uh, we've got two great companies, Habco in Connecticut and L3 Keras um, uh, from New Hampshire, and they uh, got a great team joining us. And then uh, in closing, we have a great question and answer uh, overview and, and some interactive dialogue with Nasir Manon, who is a principal engineer here at CCAT. So a full demonstration today, um, great um, represent representation from the companies. As you can see in Nerdic, um, you've maybe heard me explain this quite a few times here. We've got an unbelievable amount of resources here of throughout New England, the six New England states, everything from our industry partners, large and small, through the educational institutions, and our great partners, the MEPs, the PTAPs, and all those, everybody's kind of doing their thing and really working as hard as they can on a state level. But how we do this more on a regional level is really going to be where the greatest impact is, especially when you talk about advancing technology and you talk about things like workforce development and training. And what Nerdic is doing for all of us finally is really having that convening space, that collaborative type of opportunity. We can leverage federal funding with some of the valuable funding that's available on the state level and make sure that we're bringing the most impactful programming to the companies, to the supply chain in particular. And you see you have Nerdic in the middle, this industry 4.0 readiness ecosystem. And, and for now it is very much around industry 4.0, but uh, again, topics like workforce education are gonna be melded into that. You see the great partners around that circle, that Nerdic circle. And then of course the areas of focus on the right side. So I encourage you to stay engaged, look in the Nerdic website. It's gonna be a lot more programming and wanna see a lot more from Nerdic. So together as a region, we can become a lot more powerful and leverage what we're doing on a state level. So at this time, I'd like to bring out a great partner and a good friend, Eric Fogelman. Um, Eric is a senior technology solutions consultant with Constep. That's Connecticut's MEP. Um, arguably, the guys that are out there, that front line, Eric, you guys, I don't know how many companies you're in front of every week. You've got a great technical team. And, you know, we talk about Industry 4.0, all these different programs, and you're really spearheading Siri now, the assessments that need to be done, which we'd love to hear a little bit about. But as you look at all these partners and programming, today's topic, uh, you know, augmented reality, what does that kind of mean to you? Or what do you think about that? And how do we get this to the companies and really show them what a valuable resources can be? All right, yeah, thanks, thanks, Ron, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, that's that's a great question. I mean, I, I love this. I mean, I, obviously, I'm really passionate about everything around Industry 4.0. Uh, some some great technology, some great things that are coming to fruition. Um, I had the the um, the great fortune to be in a, another industry, uh, you know, 10, 12 years ago when a lot of this stuff was kind of being really developed, and and you know, a lot of things were really in their their infant stages. And and it's been fun to see that growth, you know, from things that were very much a uh, you know a test bench kind of situation where they were cobbled together, and and you were just kind of just peeking behind the curtain to see what was coming. And, and now to really see it uh, ready for prime time, hitting the market, getting out there. And um, it's it's fantastic from the standpoint of, of being a technology enthusiast, like I am being a, a nerd at heart and loving to see all of this stuff. That's great. Uh, but what's more important is the, the impact that we have on people and the impact that these technologies have uh, on manufacturers to be more competitive, to be more productive. Um, being able to leverage all of these things and and i say this all all the time as, as a technology person i realize that it's not just about technology for the sake of technology but it's about making an impact and that's really the driving force behind uh the mep network the manufacturing extension partnership from nist is making an impact on those small to medium manufacturers um, bringing tools to them that they might not be aware of 
helping them with the adoption of things and and this is a great partnership that we have with you at CCAT is as we bring things to the attention of folks um, having the opportunity to evaluate things and de-risk things before they um, you know jump off the ledge so to speak and, and dive into it um, and I'm really excited about today's topic and, and about um, uh, augmented reality mixed reality all those things in general uh, it's it's exciting from a standpoint of uh, a cool looking technology but also because of the level of impact that we can have in places um, you know as you adopt these tools to to increase uh, the productivity of a company to increase the productivity of your employees whether it's a, a heads up display so that they can see things in context as they're uh, you know pulling parts from from warehousing or as they're assembling parts on a bench if they can see guides and, and work instructions right there in front of them um, but then other other aspects as well the ability to tie in remote experts that are off-site um, you know this is really going to bring a lot of benefit to people to um, you know, build off of the, the great employees that they have to begin with, but give them more capabilities. And, and again, that's that's where that augmented portion comes in. How can we help employees do more and, and you know, make those intelligent decisions? And we see a lot of great applications everywhere from, uh, you know, streamlining the training of new employees. Um, you know, we're big proponents of the, the training within industry, uh, TWI methodology. And I, I feel like this dovetails perfectly into that because you can have things um, you know, go through a virtual training of something, see things in context, see things, not just words on a page, not just somebody talking about it and kind of waving their hands, but you can see that that virtual representation of it. Um, even benefits like, uh, you know, teaching somebody how to use a new piece of equipment. Uh, there's, there's always that fear when you train somebody on a new piece of equipment that they might crash a, a spindle into a workpiece or, um, you know, they, they wander a little too far from the parameters and, and bad things happen. So helping people have that that safe environment to learn a new piece of equipment and try things out, uh, you know, crash the spindle virtually a few times before they're at the, you know, $250,000 machining center. So, um, but really it's it's exciting. And I've, I've had a couple of opportunities to, um, um, you know, visit with the folks at SphereGen and look at some of the things that they're doing. And it's it's amazing the way that they're using the technology, the things that they're enabling people to do. Uh, and, and I'm excited to be sharing this with uh, with more people through this project. Is there a guy? I don't know. Usually I have a couple of questions, follow on questions, but man, you hit everything right on the right <laughs> on the money. Um, you know, I, I I do I share your your passion. It's, you know, you get so excited about all the things you see, and and maybe you can get kind of overexcited in some of the technologies, and some of them won't have uh, the impact, or or maybe aren't ready for the impact. So I think. What you said is so vitally important and even to this audience and those that we interact with is we spend a lot of time looking at this stuff so we know we're confident this can make an impact and we're going to hear from the companies because they're the ones that matter in the end um but yeah this is an exciting technology and i'd like to also look at this as almost a workforce development play because you know you get this next generation and you got kind of this wow factor you know you put in the halo lens or you to say, hey, we've got this real world environment. Now we're putting computer generated information into it. And you can make mistakes and you can do anything you want because you're really not gonna hurt anything. And it's a it's a great platform to experiment in, but to, to actually make real changes. And like you said, even bring people from outside your organization into right. an environment and, and do some really amazing things. So, you know, it, it's it's a great time to, to be doing this, and I see you, you know your passion for it. So, and and is this this is something that you're discussing, obviously, with the rest of the MEPs throughout New England? Yes. Yep. Yeah. It's uh, you know as as we look at um, you know the different tools that are out there. Uh, this is one of the great things about that MEP network um, at a national level, but also at a, a regional level, uh, is is the ability to uh, you know, see things that that we come across in our in our areas. Uh, you know, share those insights, share those new tools that are out there, um, expand that message, and and you know, help uh, help the people like like SphereGen who are developing these technologies get to a broader audience. Um, but then also helping the the small manufacturing community who's um, you know really struggling to try to find um, it, like you mentioned, it's it's an information overload. There's so many different resources so many tools out there and you know you go to a website and of course you're going to get the 
the great sales pitch, you're going to get the cool looking videos and demos. Um, but having having those resources and those people who understand, um, you know, what does it take to deploy this? What's the real story behind? Um, you know, it's it's easy to use. Uh, what's the real story there, and, and what is the real uh, effort that's going to be required, and what are the real benefits that that can come out of it? Um, and so sharing that, you know, sharing that information, sharing that uh, that understanding is is such a critical piece of this for all of us to to expand this in our region and nationally and and really, you know, help the U.S. manufacturing community excel and uh, you know leverage all the benefits of these technologies. Well, that's great, Eric. Thank you. And you know, you look at the slide here. We've got some great partners. Really, when you look at the network and and us even chatting today, we we really want to kind of be that trusted network. Uh, I mean, with with all of us here and a lot of partners that that aren't on this slide. Um, right. That means a lot. We're going to be able to bring in front of and and demonstrate and help guide. Um, the, the supply chain, so in the manufacturing community. So anyway, thank you for your time today. It's going to be a great presentation. So um, look forward, Eric, to, to having you back on, obviously, and, and working with you. It's, it's been a great partnership. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So at this time, we're going to bring on the uh, SphereGen team. And uh, we've got, again, Amy Pacelli, an account executive, and also Andrew Bogliardo, and lead mixed reality developer. And um, uh, Amy and Andrew, you guys got a great presentation today. I got a chance to look through it, and uh, it's going to be really exciting to see. So I don't know if you're going to go on. Andrew's going to come on later, but um, we will turn the program over to you. Thank you very much, Ron, and thank you to Eric as well for all the kind words. Uh, we were lucky enough to meet him early in his time there, and the technology has come a long way, even in the last two years or so. So a little bit about SphereGen. Um, you know, we are a Microsoft Mixed Reality partner. We were actually the first one on the East Coast. And for a long, long time, we were the only service provider in New England um, for Mixed Reality. So uh, we were actually founded back in 2008. And our background is in doing application development. We do have clients and offices around the globe. And our specialization has always been highly innovative projects especially ones that are aimed at increasing business efficiency. Um, we do have our own products as well um, that we have split out now in two separate companies. We have four areas we work in. The one we're gonna focus on today is mixed reality. And uh, we'll break down for you in just a moment kind of what mixed reality is, but we also work in virtual and augmented reality as well. Uh, mixed reality and augmented reality are very similar but you'll see a couple differences in our next slides. So what are the differences? Um, some of you may already be familiar with these terms, virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. But for those who aren't, we wanted just to take a minute or two to break down what the differences are to help you understand what's happening when we show the demos of the projects that we did later on. So virtual reality, uh, that's probably the one that is the widest spread in the market. People are the most familiar with it. It's a fully enclosed headset, so I wouldn't be able to see anything outside of that. And it's all virtual content and virtual graphics. So this is really practical for people who are training, um, but not practical if you need to walk around or move at all because you can't see where you're going. Uh, the next one is augmented reality. So augmented reality is in the real world. A lot of people are familiar with this, but might not affiliate it. It kind of has an overlap with special effects. Um, the difference with augmented reality is it's virtual content that is broadcast over the real world, but it's done in real time. So it's just augmenting what's already there. You'll notice in this picture, the robot is right in front of me. And that's because usually augmented reality is on a phone or a tablet. And it will just project inside of that device onto what you immediately see. So if I walk to the kitchen, the robot would be following me there as well. It's not permanently stationed where I've placed it. And finally, mixed reality, which is what we're going to focus on today. Mixed reality uses a unique subset of basically anchors that can pin it to a real world location. And that's kind of why it's mixed reality, because it's mixing the real world with virtual content. And uh, you'll notice here the robot's actually pinned to a specific location. We find that for manufacturing, usually this is the most practical, because you want something stable and anchored to a specific item. 
And that way, if you're overlaying digital content, it's not going to shift or move, which is something that we actually worked a lot on in these projects. So best use cases for AR, um, you'll see a lot of things with augmented reality, like I said, and tablets. You can just click through the pictures. It's fine. <laughs> Um, and this is something where you are able to hold a tablet with two hands. That's when you should use augmented reality. Or if you're tying it into another system that's also mobile-based, that's a great opportunity as well. It's not really designed for hands-free. So you can go to the next slide. So mixed reality, you'll notice all of these are hands-free. Um, this is the HoloLens in these pictures. That's our favorite headset currently because it's just ahead of the market on where the technology is at. Uh, mixed reality is great if you need to work with your hands to follow instructions because you're able to do a pretty accurate virtual overlay of those directions. Uh, you're also able to do things like make 3D video calls as well. And the HoloLens is the device we use for these projects. The HoloLens is an excellent um, device for, first of all, it's about $3,500. Um, so for mixed reality devices, it is on the higher end for cost, but it is a fully wearable computer and the possibilities of what you can do with it just continue to expand on a regular basis. Um, we're particularly interested in things like voice commands and eye tracking. It can also recognize your gestures, and it's fairly complex, the 3D models you're able to show. And these are just some of the features of the device. Um, one thing to note, the battery is in the back. It's, not on, it's permanently attached, so to charge it, you do have to plug it in. Um, a lot of our clients that are in manufacturing will have a dedicated charging station. Um, the battery life is about three to four hours, depending on what application you are using. Um, so that's actually pretty good considering it's fully wireless and a lot of the applications are doing a pretty heavy lift. You do not need a ton of bandwidth to use this. You can also connect it to hot, hot spots as well, um, but it is fairly low bandwidth. And one thing I do wanna note, so the HoloLens, it can see everything that you see. <laughs> So sometimes people are not aware of that, but that's really important to note. Um, if you do have sensitive processes, you wanna make sure you're tying your HoloLens to your organization in a secure way. It also responds to your voice. It responds to what we call your focus, which is where you're looking. It's kind of combined with how your head moves and where your eyes go. It responds to your gestures. So you get to see some of that today. It can measure rooms and objects. It can also recognize objects, which is something really exciting we've been working with. And it does calibrate for your eyes specifically. It can do iris recognition. Um, and the content it projects is very interactive. So you'll see in this picture, that's me playing the piano through the HoloLens. Um, those sort of weird looking things on my hands, that's the tracking that has been put on to track my hand movement. All right, and I'm going to turn it over to Andrew. Thank you very much, Amy. All right, Thank you. so hi, folks. Um, my name is Andrew Guagliardo. I'm one of the senior mixed reality developers at SphereGen. And we're going to be talking about um, two different partners that we worked with in order to kind of uh, do an exploration of mixed reality technology and to kind of explore what it could possibly do for uh, these two uh, pilot partners. So today, first, we're going to talk about Habco and our uh, working process with them. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we're going to talk about um, Habco as a company, kind of the problem that we discussed with them that they were looking to solve, what we kind of proposed as a solution, and then what we ended up putting together for Habco and kind of what the uh, final result was. At the end of this, we're also going to invite Habco on just to have a couple comments. So. Habco produces state-of-the-art equipment and technologies, as well as providing logistics support. They were initially incorporated in 1970, and they recently celebrated uh, their 50-year anniversary. They do things like engine tooling, airframe tooling, and also are a licensed FAA uh, repair station. So when we first engaged with Habco, we had a discussion kind of about what sort of problems they were thinking they'd like to solve with mixed reality. And one of the big things that came up is that 
as part of their fabrication process, they need to lay out a lot of stencil markers. And these markers can be time consuming to place and they need to be accurately aligned and you know, properly leveled. And you know, this can be a tedious, uh, time consuming process. And so they were interested in ways that they could potentially um, improve this process, either to speed it up, make it easier or all of the above um, by using the HoloLens and mixed reality technology. So as part of our discussions with Habico and uh, thinking about the process, we kind of proposed that we would put together a small uh, custom software solution using the HoloLens. As Amy mentioned, uh, the HoloLens is a computer that basically is wearable. And so in addition to kind of off the shelf products, it's possible to design custom software as well. And because Habco had such a nice, like small targeted use case, um, we were confident that we could build them a small piece of custom software that they could use for this demonstration process. So we had a couple of prerequisites that we you know, needed to basically have to make this work. And those included things like uh, a 3D model of the uh, item that Habco wanted to lay stencils on, as well as all of the information from Habco about you know, the stencils themselves, their placement, their font, things like that. And as part of the solution, we were going to use uh, QR codes as a way to anchor the hologram. So as Amy mentioned a little bit earlier, the HoloLens is spatially aware. So it is mapping the environment around it and mapping its 3D space. And we can leverage things like QR codes to place anchors to tell it where to locate a hologram and to help lock that hologram in place. So after we basically put all of these prerequisites together, we started to kind of get to work and started to collaborate. And through an iterative process, Habco generated a 3D model markup, um, basically using CAD software, and then passed it over to us at SphereGen. We went through and cleaned it up because there are some modifications that usually need to be made in order to uh, put it on the HoloLens and added things like the appropriate fonts, sizing, and location for the stencils. Going back and forth with Habco, we also kind of thought about where we were gonna place the QR code and set up the marker so that it would be easily kind of added uh, to the device. And you know, as these pieces of equipment are basically coming off and need to have stencils applied, it was important that we made something that was kind of reusable. So if you can actually see on the uh, right-hand side there, there's this little circular disc that was a QR code that we magnetized that could just easily be attached to the uh, piece of equipment, scanned, and then Habco could use that to lay their stencils and then pull it off and put it on their next piece of equipment. So we wrote some custom software using uh, C-sharp code and an application called Unity in order to have the headset identify the QR code and lock it into place. So as I mentioned, this was an iterative process. So we passed uh, the solution over to Habco as soon as we had something working and had them kind of start playing with it and giving us feedback about what they thought and what kind of needed to be adjusted. And that part I mentioned about the magnetized QR code was something that we kind of discovered as we were thinking about it. And we kind of deliberately set it up so that it could be easily affixed. Um, another thing that we noticed was that the stencils needed to be um, properly leveled as well. So not just in the right location, but it's very important that they're properly leveled. And we were actually able to use the accelerometers on the HoloLens to actually determine the direction of gravity and then make sure that the stencils, even if there was something off with the scanning, would autocorrect and level themselves properly. Another point was because they might be doing multiple pieces of equipment in a single run, the application needed to be able to rescan a new anchor. So if they were to scan an anchor on a piece of equipment, the hologram and stencils would pop up relative to that anchor. And then when they move the anchor, they need to be able to reset everything attached to that new anchor. So we incorporated all of those changes and then delivered the application changed back to Habco for them to try again. And throughout all of this, Habco was testing it out and training themselves on how to use the HoloLens 2 as well. You can see actually in the bottom right corner there, this is a little menu we added to allow to be able to rescan the QR code and also to auto level the stencils. And this is a menu that's tied to the user's hand. So it's completely out of their way until they put their hand palm up and then they have to look at their palm to pull up the menu. This makes it very easy to access without being intrusive. So now we're gonna show uh, two quick little videos 
The first video is going to be the previous method that Habco used for laying out their stencils. And then it's going to follow up with an example of a video taken from inside the HoloLens of what our solution looked like. So in just a moment here, uh, Donna will be playing those videos for us. So you'll notice that the process is uh, relatively quick, but it does require, you know, constant measuring and uh, adjustments. makes it so fast. Just line it up, line up the H, make sure you're nice and flat and level, and boom, got that stencil done. So you can see in the first video that, you know, uh, Ray basically needs to go down and kind of measure everything out. And you know, while the process is kind of quick, you can imagine how repeating that step for every single stencil can slowly add up additional time. Um, on the second video that we showed, you saw from kind of the exterior and then from the interior from the headset that basically he just needed to line it up with the stencil itself. Now, one thing I do want to call out is that because the recordings from inside the headset are basically a single view, um, Ray is actually getting a binocular view. So some of the offset that we're seeing in the video isn't present when you're actually wearing the headset. Now, um, at this point, I'd actually like to invite um, Ray and Mike from Habco to kind of uh, join me. And we'll talk about some of the comments uh, that Habco has from this process and what they thought about it. Hey, great. Hey, Ray. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi there. So, uh, you know, We'd gotten feedback from you folks that you were interested in uh, kind of continuing with this and that you kind of thought that this would really help kind of uh, reduce cycle times. And if you want to speak to that, uh, please let us know. Yeah, sure. Um, so technology for us was was really very exciting um, because as we start on this, on this project that we're working on now with this gearbox container, this represents one of, of many opportunities that we have that are, that are larger quantity, big scope, projects for HADCO. Um, and, and what we saw immediately from this is that it, it helps us to reduce our amount of time that, that we're processing. Um, not only the stencils that we saw, but we're looking at it for other things, uh, complex assemblies, um, and, and some other stenciling projects that might be a little more difficult than what we did. Uh, this particular project, we didn't really have any um, scope as far as exact locations where they were supposed to line up in place, but we have other products where we do have that measurement tolerance uh, to put those stencils on. So that's that's going to be a big help for us. Um, and, and the interesting thing to see, and Ray will kind of touch on this a little bit, um, you saw in the video kind of quickly there, as, as Ray was walking up to the to the container that we were stenciling, you could see the other guys in the background, and and there was just this interest of folks who are our shop floor laborer people, it's not necessarily technology people, but they were they just drew them like a magnet to the process. It was actually it was great to see. We've got some people that are that are just barely using a cell phone and said, oh wow, let me see this, let me put the headphone, you know, let me put the headset on, let me try it. 
and it was uh, instantaneous, the, the, the great positive feedback that we had from that. So uh, we see this moving forward as a, as a great opportunity for us, not, not just in the stenciling that we did uh, to start with and look at other manufacturing things, possibly welding things. So we, we only see an upside from this. Uh, so so that's, great. Yeah, that's great to hear, especially, you know, the part about you know, new technology always kind of has that little bit of hurdle, right? About trying to need to learn something new and making sure that it's kind of accessible for everybody to kind of remove that barrier. So, you know, everyone can kind of take advantage of what's possible. You know, that's definitely a big component. And um, I know that you, you know, you folks are interested in, you know, potentially looking at also like side-by-side -side comparisons, right? To kind of lock down what the actual, you know, improvement might be, right? And um, Ray, I know that you were kind of the primary person, uh, you know, working with the device. Um, and, you know, I, I'm curious, you know, how hard you kind of found it to kind of get used to using it and, you know, anything, uh, any comments you have about, you know, what you see us going from here? Uh, well, for me, it was very easy to use, but that's expected given my age and interest in technology. <laughs> but what was actually exciting to see was, as Mike mentioned before, some of the shop employees who aren't very tech savvy, they put the glasses right on and within a couple seconds they were up and running like they had no problem using it it was it was really exciting to see that's great awesome well um with that uh, we'll probably move on and talk about our next uh pilot company and uh folks if you have any questions about habco um, we'll be taking kind of all the questions uh at the end okay so not only uh, working with Habco, we also engaged with uh, another company, L3 Harris, as part of this uh, program to uh, establish another kind of, you know, pilot demonstration of this technology. And so we're now going to step through um, a very similar kind of format where we're going to talk briefly about L3 Harris, uh, the problem that they were interested in trying to solve, what we proposed, and how we worked together to try to come up with a solution. So L3 Harris is uh, based, um, we worked with uh, the office up in New Hampshire and they build commercial civilian and defense solutions in a wide variety of areas. Um, they do things like integrated vision solutions, uh, autonomous systems, electronic warfare and integrated maritime solutions. Our specific work with them for this project uh, kind of focused around the IVS systems, the integrated visual systems. So L3 Harris was looking at a way to kind of improve their training outcomes. Um, you know, scaling up workers that are new to different processes, standardizing how their different uh, systems were being built, and to increase efficiency by having their training basically hands-on and guided rather than just kind of, you know, being from a traditional paper manual. And along with this, they were also hoping to kind of improve, improve the throughput of their assembly um, while also improving part quality and cutting down on the number of escapes that they saw. So this solution uh, was a little bit more involved. And so kind of as part of it, this being a larger like set of like almost complete work instructions, we worked with L3 Harris and they actually went through and evaluated over a hundred of their own work instructions to identify what they most wanted to target um, with this demo and this solution. And we at SphereGen recommended kind of using an off the shelf application that is already built for the HoloLens 2. And this is a product from Microsoft called Dynamics 365 Guides. And this would allow us to basically have a framework of the solution in place that we could then expand and customize specifically for L3 Harris. Now, there were a couple of limitations that came with that, and I'll be talking about that in just a little bit. That said, this ended up being very successful because we were really able to kind of hit the ground running by having a lot of the kind of heavy lifting already built for us by leveraging guides. So we also thought about the process and recognized that to really kind of make this helpful, it needed to be more than just kind of pictures and text. So we also discussed creating uh, custom animations using 3D models and 3D mockups. And as part of that, we collaborated with CCAT in order to kind of uh, help generate and then print these 3D mockups for use with the solution. So what was really unique here was that there was kind of this like, uh, you know, three-way collaboration happening between uh, CCAD ourselves and L3 Harris. And it made this process uh, a lot of fun to work on. So 
when we dug in, uh, we essentially, you know, started out with L3 Harris, you know, looking through their set of work instructions. As I mentioned, you know, they went through and essentially um, did kind of a survey and picked out what they thought would be kind of most useful for them. They provided um, photos and feedback kind of throughout the process. And we had a very open dialogue basically throughout the entire time, just like with Habco. Um, we worked with CCAT to create a mock-up of a 3D model. You can actually see that there on the right-hand side. And as part of that, CCAT also uh, generated a 3D printed model. So an actual like, you know, hard copy that was sent to L3 Harris to use with the guide that we created. So they could kind of see what it would be like in practice to, you know, create this assembly by using these augmented reality work instructions. They, CCAT also provided us with the 3D model so that we would be able to create the animations and graphics in addition to using the photos and text that L3 Harris provided. As part of this, uh, we also trained L3 Harris in how to use the HoloLens and the solution, just like with Habco, and added all the work instructions um, into the guides framework. And this was a very iterative process. So as we were going along, we were creating and adding additional animations. We were adjusting things through the work instructions. And what was really great was that, you know, by using guides, this process was pretty easy and able to kind of have very quick turnaround. So after we did some initial trials um, of the work instructions, the response from L3 Harris was, was really positive, but we needed to continue to make some, you know, small adjustments as we went along. And so, as I mentioned, you know, as we continued with this, we saw certain areas where it would be helpful to add an additional image, certain areas where maybe an animation would help make things a little bit more understandable. And we also had some discussions around, you know, what the future work might be and how to expand the solution and the, requir and the requirements. So as part of this, um, not only do I want to talk about what was accomplished, I also want to talk a little bit kind of about um, what was learned here. And one of the things is that L3 Harris having, you know, defense contracts has a lot of things that have ITAR requirements. And one of the downsides of Microsoft's guides is that it does have some ITAR restrictions at this point in time. So we had to have, you know, some discussions about what the capability in the future would be to be able to still leverage something like this while being ITAR compliant. That said, we uh, still kind of did a great job with this project and it was really great to rapidly iterate with CCAT and with L3 Harris. And um, we definitely heard also, and we'll hear a little bit later that some of the folks from L3 Harris specifically in the IVS division saw value in this experience and definitely were interested in, you know, seeing more about what the HoloLens can do. So moving forward, we're gonna be exploring more options about how to continue with this process and um, be able to work with you know, ITAR requirements. So next up, we're gonna have a uh, video that shows kind of a couple of selected snippets of the solution that we put together for L3 Harris. And there's no audio for this, so I'm gonna describe certain portions of this as we go. But essentially what we're going to see here is we're going to see from inside the headset an example of uh, someone kind of doing a dry run. So at the very beginning of any guides process, we're showing folks kind of what they need in order to start the process. And so they have their list of equipments required. And here's an, and an example with an animation of kind of what they're going to be doing and how the pieces are assembled. We can see down here that they're just checking that they have all of their equipment and the proper pieces before going to the next step. Now, another thing that Guides provides is the ability for users to provide input. So they're being asked to count and ensure that there are six screws present. And after they do that, they're going to need to select their confirmation. You'll see that there's another option underneath in just a moment here, where they could also select that there are missing screws. If they see that, it's going to ask them to kind of notify their supervisor and stop work. So there's a way to kind of make these guides able to deal with certain types of exceptions or escapes. And so for some of these steps, you can see we're providing images. For other steps, we're providing 3D models and animations. And for even other steps, we're you know, asking the user to confirm that certain things have been done or that certain things are in existence. 
This step in particular also includes a timer countdown for the 10 seconds that a user basically needs to hold the cap in order to make sure that they get it properly seated. And finally, at the end of this process, they're asked to verify that all of their work has been properly completed. And all of this information gets captured and can be reviewed that you know they verified and checked off that all of these steps were done. And so that's a brief example. The work instructions were uh, a bit longer and more involved than that. And we can definitely talk uh, more about that in just a moment. So I'd like to next, um, we're going to talk about comments um, from L3 Harris. And I'd like to invite uh, Nino on from L3 Harris to talk with me kind of about what the working process was like and you know where they think the next steps are going to be. So thanks so much, Nino. Um, you know, I want to say it was, it was great working yeah, with you thanks. folks. And uh, yeah, just interested in kind of, you know, hearing from you. I have some of them listed here on the slide, you know, your comments and ideas about the process and, you know, what you saw, you know, about the technology. Sure, sure. Yeah, and, and thanks so much. Uh, as Andrew was talking, you know, we, we, we ran into some hurdles uh, due, to, due to some of the ITAR restrictions. Restrictions um, and uh, you know I want to make sure I, I, I give a big thanks to, to Nerdic, CCAT, and SphereGen to work through this process. Uh, it's uh, a lot of enthusiasm from the team. Uh, I want to also give a, a special thanks to, to Jim and, and the team at IVS for deploying and getting uh, feedback. Uh, Jim will talk a bit more about the the initial feedback and and thoughts uh, as well moving forward. But uh, as you can see with the part, there's a there's a lot of intricate uh, parts as you would imagine with night vision goggles. And we ran into a, most of our work instructions uh, with ITAR have restrictions with them. And so we tried working through the ITAR process and found that this was just going to take too long. And so we were about two weeks ahead of schedule and quickly found ourselves right up against the, the wall to get things done uh, due to that process. And so with the creativity of uh, SphereGen, uh, CCAT, uh, you know, thank you, Nasir, for all of the extra work and helping us get through. We, we created a, a representative part that had all of the things that we would be interested in at IVS, uh, an optics path, a, a cover, uh, processes of applying coatings and cleaning and, and looking for screws with adhesives. So that, that little part is representative of many of the instructions uh, and, and the components of the processes that we would perform at IVS. So somebody at IVS could look at that part in that this work instruction and see how it uh, translates into a night vision goggle, as well as it allows us to publicly share this. And so um, there'll be others that I hope will be able to pick up on this and then move forward. Uh, we will continue, you know, certainly there's interest at, at IVS on pursuing uh, pursuing this technology to see, you know, how far we can take it. Uh, we've got to figure out uh, uh, ways to work with the ITAR uh, constraints with the, you know, as defined Microsoft Teams. Uh, we've already had some discussions on on possible alternatives, um, as as well as, you know, what is the right fit within the organization. I thought, you know, we with our first concept was this would be great for work instructions. We also see some opportunities as, as a training aid with the animations, with the timer, the ability to teach somebody, you know, how much how much time to apply a, a solder a hot soldering iron to a, to a component to, to properly flow solder. Uh, great for getting people up the learning curve quickly. So whether it's work instructions or, or or quickly ramping an employee up through training, I think there's some great op opportunities here. Um, we're, we're currently, you know, internally having some discussions on what is that next step and, and how do we get there. So yeah, we definitely look forward to uh, to working and and uh, working with this this team. Um, and and I think <clears throat> most importantly was what is it like to work uh, with this Nerdic community? And that was the big takeaway: uh, the ability of the team to be flexible, to find uh, creative solutions to problems, to continue driving forward, uh, and and then ultimately be you know wildly successful. I think. We'll, was the value that was gained out of this, right? That's the big take, take home message was, we wanna to continue to engage with Nerdic. We wanna to continue to drive new solutions and open eyes on, on new ways to do things. So thank you, Andrew and, and the team at SphereGen, uh, Jim and the, and the team at IVS. 
uh, Ron, Joe, and, and Nasir, especially with all that great work at CCAT. So very much looking forward to, to continuing to be part of this and, and supporting and helping in any way we can. Um, I, I do want to turn it over to Jim. Uh, Andrew, if you, I'm sure, sure you've got some questions yeah, on what is it like, you know, Jim, what did you find in terms of deploying with, with employees? So I'll, I'll turn it over to you now, Andrew. Yeah, no, I was going to do the exact same thing. And uh, so, you know, Jim, I know you spent kind of a lot of time uh, with the device hands on curious just to, you know, hear your thoughts and what it was like showing it to other folks at L3 Harris and, um, you know, uh, things you see about it going forward and, you know, things that you still maybe have questions about. All right. And by the way, the vice president of operations, Tom McDonald, just ran into my room and said, I can't get on. Are you seeing it? Yeah, I'm seeing it. And our director of operations, Jake Clever, he's on. I'm not seeing the videos. Don't worry, you guys. I got the videos. I got the presentation. <laughs> and I got, I got a lot better videos, too, that I didn't share with you, Andrew, just because, like you said, the HoloLens sees everything. And yep. So I didn't want anything in the background mm -hmm. making its way out of here with the ITAR. But I, I went around from uh, the president to the floor, everybody's head I put them on. It's just like the Habco guys were talking about. Everybody was so excited. People were ready to run out and buy their own. But uh, <laughs> they had that, you know, that that amused, amazed smile on their face as they're pushing buttons and grabbing the jewels, spinning the bird around, all those things that you can do with just with the demo alone. But then uh, I was able to take videos of the of the guys building the parts that were made because you can project what they see on a big screen. So uh, what you had there, Andrew, unfortunately, you didn't see the guy actually building it. You, you had uh, instructions that you did, which by, by the way also was great, the way you were so fast about doing it. You showed us how the guides works. You put the pictures there, you slap it in. It couldn't be easier because this is so important for us. We have hundreds of work instructions. And so it takes a long time to learn those. And you're supposed to have the work instructions by you. So you'd have to reach up, turn the page, reach up, turn the page. But if it's right in your face, you never have to move your hand. Mm -hmm. You simply look, turns the page. You simply look, turns the page. And the piece, the 3D piece is right there. And the instructions are there. Instruction after instruction. It's so smooth. It's so much more than... Uh, just a teaching tool. It's an actual accountability tool in the sense that when you're making something over and over again, you say to yourself, did I put six screws in that or did I only put five? Uh, yeah, I must have put six. You just kind of forget where you are when you're doing things over and over again. But this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Simple as that. You never make a mistake. You never forget where you are. It's just, it was, a, it was so amazing. Everybody who's talked, it speaks more to me now because I've had them on my own head. So mm -hmm. Eric was talking and uh, you guys were talking, but now that I've really lived it and you plant that piece right where it is and you can walk out, walk back and still sit right where you left it. Um, our director of IT, his daughter learned surgery at medical school using one of these somehow. I don't know how that was, but he said, you, know, you leave the cadaver there, you walk back, you come in and still right where you left it. Uh, it's just, it's, the future is right here. <laughs> the future is, can be now for us. So and thank you so much for, you know, putting this together for us. It was really a scrambling last minute to have everything fall into place. And here you got the presentation done. Um, and we were barely putting the thing together last week. Yep. We like, we like to work so quick. It just shows how, how usable it is too. Yeah. And that, that iterative process was, was really yeah, important. That was great. Here, so. I definitely want to make sure you know that, you know, thank you to, you know, all the folks from L3 Harris and all the folks from Habco because, you know, this was only, this wasn't just like us, like putting stuff together, right? This was a collaborative process all the way through. And that was absolutely amazing. So thank you so much. Um, with that, I think, you know, we'll probably open up uh, to some questions that folks have either about, hey, Jim, <laughs> uh, either about. Um, I didn't Habco. want to turn it on myself. Oh, okay. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Either about um, Habco or L3Harris, and I'll let Nasir kind of uh, take over from here, and i um, happy to answer questions. Yeah, uh, thank you to all of you, um, Andrew, Amy, um, Enrico, uh, James, uh, Ray, um, Mike. Uh, just really, you know, it was a pleasure working with all of you. Um, I, I want to take this opportunity to say to everyone that's on the call, um, you know, if you have questions, 
Um, you've got folks that use the technology. You've got the experts in the field. Um, use the right-hand panel of the GoToWebinar. Uh, you'll see a little questions um, uh, panel that you can go ahead and type your questions in, and I'll go ahead and read them out to the to the whole um, audience so that we can get them answered for you. Uh, now's the time. It'd be great if you can get these questions in. Uh, so I do see some coming in here. Um, I'll read the first one. Um, were any of the features in the example created above and beyond basic functionality of the guide software solution? Yeah, um, definitely. So, um, you know, we, we worked with uh, Nasir and with um, L3 Harris basically to generate um, all sorts of custom 3D models and 3D pieces. So that uh, 10 second countdown that was a just a kind of a custom animation that was added in. Now there are numbers and things inside guides, but there's not really like a, a timer or anything. So we just kind of built that very quickly to um, facilitate that need. There were also um, animations to point out where the different screws were on the assembly. And there were also um, basically other animations to show, you know, seating that ring over the uh, front end of the assembly and holding it in place so it would get glued in place. Um, in addition to that, you know, uh, basically every part of Habco's was also completely custom. So the, you know, the model of their piece of equipment was something that they provided to us and that we cleaned up. And also, you know, the stencil markings essentially were kind of custom designed based on the specs that they had provided to us. Uh, another question here, um, it, it might be applicable for both uh, L3 Harris and Habco. Uh, what features would you like to see moving forward with the HoloLens? Sure, I, I think one feature that we would find to be very uh, helpful to us is the ability to record the stream of a video that the goggle is seeing and actually use that with, say, a vision inspection system to actually validate the quality of the part or actually confirm that there are six screws there and have that be a feedback into our system, even just snapshots. Uh, because sometimes when you're involved in a root cause analysis, you want to go back and look at how the part made it through your process. And having either a video stream or, or snapshots at important parts would be very helpful to us. And one of the one of the things that we saw also and saw as the next level is is kind of have the the stencils uh, that get put on the container kind of come up as as one's complete. So it sets up an order of operation so we make sure that things are getting on the same same way, same process every time. Um, some of the other questions that I see here have already been answered, so I'll go ahead and skip over those. Um, Another question for both uh, L3 Harris and, and Habco, um, what would an ideal system look like? So that's a good that's a good question. I think I'll I'll, I'll defer part of the answer to to Jim um, because Jim was actually you know on the floor working with it uh, while I was remote, kind of uh, setting up all of the the ITAR and work instructions and and and, and the parts with with Nasir, but. Um, to me, the ability of this system to actually integrate with, say, a data acquisition system or actual processes. So I mentioned earlier in, in the discussion uh, the ability to teach somebody how to solder, right? So is the solder up to temperature? Could you actually have that plug into, uh, say, a data acquisition system that's actually monitoring the temperature of, say, a, you know, a weller type of, uh, you know, soldering iron? And, and so actually have the system pull in information from other uh, components that have um, I.O. to it and then feed that into uh, the HoloLens as kind of a closed loop process. So you're confirming uh, quite a bit of information at the same time to make sure that each of the operations are, are occurring at their ideal uh, set points, I think would be fantastic. Um, Jim, any comments on kind of how it might work in a factory before any opportunities? Uh, well, yeah, that that's a very, saw? very broad uh, question. Whoops. My, uh, Maybe. No, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Anyway, um, it's a very broad question. A few issues that we came up with were the battery life. So you don't want to be tethered 
through the core definitely and um so maybe we'd have to have two sets per person uh so that was somewhat of a limitation some of the guys got kind of hot and with that around their head uh so maybe we could deal with that somehow uh one of the guys also had some issues with all the background paraphernalia tools and bins and things on the workbench he felt Felt that was a little bit of a distraction with 3D models, but uh, as I saw it, um, it wasn't a problem. So as you add more and more people and more and more jobs, I think you're going to see some things that you didn't really anticipate. So uh, it's good to pilot and and get used to what you're planning on doing and make sure that you're successful with what you really want to do. I mean, it's phenomenal, but it's bound to have some issues with some people somewhere along the way. us at Hapco, we, we, we kind of looked at this and said, okay, you know, where, where else can we use this technology? And one of the things that, that became pretty clear uh, to us is that if we could work that into a process of things that we were uh, welding or assembling and putting together, um, obviously welding masks um, present a, a challenge just in the, in the darkening and then having that computer be part of it, the lens mm -hmm. being part of it. Um, but definitely see that as something that, that could be a big advantage to us moving forward. And uh, just in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and read this one last question here. Um, and this would be directed to both, uh, uh, both companies again. Um, are you looking at other systems and would you mind sharing the experiences of the different systems for work instructions? Well, we're looking sure. at a light guiding uh, system, and, and, and I talked to Andrew about that too. And uh, um, there's not really one instead of the other. Maybe Nina was about to say this as well because he said the same thing to me. And that's uh, each thing has its pluses and minuses, and you use the preferred one in the area that you want it to be used at, and then use the other where where that works out better. Right for us at Hadco, this yeah, that's uh, that's. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, this is the only technology that, that we're evaluating right now. Yeah, and, and I was just going to, um, you know, the, with the recommendation from HAPCO on, on welding and, and my interest on soldering irons, right, it, it, maybe there's a, a potential future of a, of a thermal camera. I could see it. And so one of the things that I thought was really great about this system is, again, as, as teaching somebody how to do, uh, uh, you know, how to perform a function as part of a trade and, and, and learning learning a skill set, I could see it, you know, being fantastic for, for welding, right? In the welding pool, what's the temperature? How are you getting there? Similar to many of the robotic systems, except you have a human in the loop and you're feeding them the, the temperature profile. Uh, you know, for that same reason, on our end, it would be kind of the soldering iron and making sure the components are getting to the right temperature, having some sort of a feedback. I was talking about getting that information in from a, from a soldering station as part of some I/O, but if the if the uh, Hala lens had a, a not, you know a thermal camera on there, maybe maybe that. Well, Greg, really appreciate your comments. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for participating. Uh, in these pilot projects. Thank you to Andrew so much for, for all the work that you did there with the companies. I uh, really appreciate your feedback. It, it gives us a, a real world you know, feedback on what this technology is. Uh, you always hear the potential, you always hear what it's you know, designed to do, uh, but it's always good to hear from the mouths of the people that use it, challenges, pros and cons. And we really appreciate you openly discussing what you felt about the technology. It really helps to uh, you know, have people see the value in it um, and whether or not it's applicable for them. So at this time, um, I just, just wanted to say thank you to all of you and I'm going to move on to the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Yep. So um, we have opportunities for uh, defense supplier companies to participate in technology demonstrations. Uh, as you saw here, um, if your company has that uh, has had at least, I, I think it's about 5% of your sales in one of the last five years that ultimately benefited the Department of Defense. Uh, we do welcome you to apply for these no-cost demonstration projects at ccat.us uh, forward slash Nerdic 
forward slash apply. Uh, these demonstrations are intended to be presented, so preferably uh, we are looking for non-ITAR or export control projects. Um, otherwise, uh, as we did in this in this particular uh, demonstration, um, we'll work with you to identify components of the project that we can record and present. Uh, we do currently have additional opportunities for free 60-day trial of artificial intelligence using Stanley's DPAL training and upskilling tool. Um, if you're interested, please do apply by August 20th. Uh, we are scheduled to launch the 60-day trial by mid-September. Uh, we have a few technology demonstrations coming up over the next month uh, on August 10th, 17th, and 31st uh, from 12 to 1.30 p.m. Uh, the results of the additive manufacturing demonstration projects will be presented. Uh, it's going to be by uh, CCAT and our technology partners at the Berkshire Innovation Center, uh, University of Maine, uh, Center for uh, Additive Manufacturing of Metals, and Vermont Technical College. Um, the presentations on these technology demonstration projects are meant to illustrate real-world applications of these technologies, you know, what challenges in manufacturing these technologies help to address, um, how the technology was applied between the different pilot projects, and what outcome, uh, what, you know, what the outcome was. Uh, we, we welcome you to register uh, to attend these presentations at ccad.us forward slash nerdic. Uh, and we did want to make you aware of this great opportunity uh, for manufacturing companies. Uh, the U.S. Air Force does desire to expand the U.S. supply chain capacity uh, to manufacture small turbine engine parts, and these are engines that produce less than 2,000 pound force of thrust. Uh, the goal is to reduce cost and delivery schedules for, exist, uh, for existing suppliers uh, and stand up additional suppliers, including from non-airspace industry sectors. We welcome you to visit uh, sep.ccat.us uh, for more information and to apply for consideration for this program. Um, with that, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, we, we hope the presentation and, and really the great questions that were asked help to understand the benefits that augmented and, and mixed reality technology brings to manufacturing. Uh, if you have any further questions, please do feel free to contact us and we'll be sure to get your questions, uh, questions answered. Thank you again and, and have a great, great rest of your day.